Yes. All right, we are live. It's go time. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to 1455's Movable Type. This is our special event to coincide with the uh, recent release of issue nine on the theme of connection. Very quickly, if this is your first time joining us for one of our events, you're very warmly welcome. I greatly appreciate you checking us out. I certainly will appreciate if you spread the word, which I know you will because you're going to enjoy the talent on display tonight. My name is Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455 and I describe my job, especially for these events, is hosting parties of very talented and cool people. So this is very easy for me and it's a great joy to have the opportunity not only to uh, publish 1455's Movable Type, which is a uh, bi-monthly digital publication. Uh, our, what we started with our last issue is we are going to have a special reading to coincide with each release, uh, which gives everybody an opportunity to really experience the art in, in a different uh, living color way, which I think still doesn't quite approximate what we want to see in a post-COVID world, but boy, I think we all love the human contact and being able to at least see and hear people if we can't be in the same room. So I thank all of the talent for being here. I thank everyone for checking us out. And um, my goal for tonight is really to step out of the way. I will introduce each new artist and you'll, you'll hear from them. But just by way of, of a quick setup, um, I think it's fair to say that while we want to have a specific theme for each issue of movable type, um, all of the issues in some way are always uh, kind of celebrating storytelling. And of course, storytelling is a viable means of communication. But for this particular issue with the theme of communication, we wanted to home in on the miracle of art and the way that art allows us to communicate and be in dialogue, not only with each other, but with history and to read history and see history we're constantly in dialogue with voices that have come before us and uh, art at its best can unite us rather than divide us. And I think that that's particularly resonant in 2022 and with some of the things going on in the world. So I'm really proud of this issue. Um, I'm also very kind of proud to brag that we have really endeavored and we will continue to endeavor to let this magazine evolve. Um, but what started as really an online magazine that was a PDF, we've turned into a real multimedia platform to celebrate storytelling. Uh, we are now featuring prose, poetry, memoir, essay, critical essay, visual art, and in this issue for the first time, music. Uh, I couldn't be more proud because we really want this content to be both diverse and inclusive and the wider spectrum of voices and individuals that we can accommodate the better. So I think that is more than enough for me. I'll, I'll also say that uh, we had 15 individual contributors, which more than doubled our usual output. And while numbers are unimportant, I'm certainly not measuring our success by level of engagement or number of contributors. I think it speaks to the capacity that we have to bring these voices out, the fact that people want to be a part of this. And um, I'd like to see it grow just because we will see tonight why there are so many worthy voices talking about the theme of communication and, and connection and, and how that can help us. So uh, we do have a couple of glaring omissions. I have two individuals uh, that have some uh, health related, nothing serious, but two of our, our featured artists cannot join us tonight. So that's a good way for me to remind everyone. If you're checking this out, I'm glad you're here, but I also encourage you to go to 1455litarts.org. All of the issues of movable type and links to all of our programming, all of our videos, et cetera, are freely available. Uh, you can check it out. You'll be able to see this issue in its entirety um, and read the bios of all the contributors, see their pictures and, and see their work. Um, Kim Tridman, who uh, let us use a portfolio of her unbelievable and provocative visual art is not able to join us and talk tonight. But in a way, I feel good that I can just get out of the way and say, please go check out her work in this issue because it's unbelievable. Uh, and it really just needs to be experienced. There's not a lot that I could or would say about it. Uh, and Kristen Bach, whose poetry from her collection, Glass Bikini, 
which is an amazing collection of poetry, uh, is not able to join us tonight. I'd love to hear her work, uh, but we'll have her involved in, in a future event. And Sandy Lutton, one of the other contributors, had a traveling engagement, so she's not able to join us. However, one of our featured authors is Lena Derhali, and she is here. And I could not be more proud to have the opportunity to run an excerpt from her forthcoming book. Lena, I want to let you introduce yourself and your project and, and feel free to read a section that was either in movable type or, or really whatever you want to do. But let me move aside and uh, let's get to show on the road. Thank you, Sean. And again, I'm really honored to be in the company of all these wonderful artists and just very um, honored that you included an excerpt from my forthcoming book. As Sean said, my name is Lena Derhali. I am a licensed psychotherapist here in Washington, DC. And we also hear my friend Haley, who is on here, who will speak too. She's also a licensed psychotherapist. We're both certified in something called Imago Relationship Therapy. And the heart of Imago is we work with a lot of couples and it's really about connection. And so this, this theme really speaks to just the work I generally do in life, which is um, connecting people and keeping people connected. Um, my, my clinical interests outside of that are actually narcissism, which both my books, uh, my, this is my, the, my second book is the one ex, excerpted in this. And um, I'm interested in narcissism because it is the opposite of connection as far as I'm concerned. And so narcissism is defined as a lack of empathy, entitlement, exploitation, self-centeredness, and attention-seeking. And my second book in May is called The Facebook Narcissist, Hi Facebook Live, um, How to Identify and Protect Yourself and Your Loved Ones from Social Media Narcissism. And I'm not gonna read um, from the excerpt because that's online, but I did just wanna talk a little bit about the motivation for publishing that particular excerpt, which is the last chapter of the book. And it was interesting because I wanted to look at how social media contributes to uh, narcissism in our culture and how that is. And, you know, I wrote this in the context of the COVID pandemic. We're at the height of misinformation and the harm that is caused by that. And oftentimes you have people in positions of power using social media as a tool to knowingly spread misinformation as a way to seek attention for themselves, which in the narcissism world we would call narcissistic supply. So the excerpt that I chose from the book to feature in 1455 was my experience uh, having a child in my extended family with cancer, living through a pandemic and having to just fear for her life, you know, all the time. She has complications from a bone marrow transplant, which makes her lungs very, very fragile. And so COVID was a huge threat, um, not just to her and our family, but to other people as well. And the experience of uh, being online and hearing people, you know, unfiltered, especially when they're anonymous. And so when people are anonymous online, it gives them this brazen sort of ability to say what they want. And a lot of the times it exposes this real lack of empathy and entitlement in society. And I think we saw that in the pandemic. So what it was like for me to have a child in my family with this condition and hear people say, well, I don't care about the vulnerable. I don't care about the immunocompromised. And just looking at how anonymity on the internet really takes us away from connection and how dangerous it is, how people can just say whatever they want. And also the consequences of that for anybody who's just observing that, how toxic that is for us as observers of that type of behavior and um, what that can really do to our mental health. So it sort of looks at the relationship of what happens when we're exposed to this cruelty and lack of empathy online and what that does to our mental health. And, and so I really wanted to touch upon that and realize that while social media is great for so many things in connecting us, um, we also need to be super mindful about how it really disconnects us and, and makes us less empathetic. So that's just my little spiel. I'll hand it back to you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Lena, thank you so much. And of course, you and I will be in conversation. Gosh, is it May? I don't have my calendar. It me. is. It's the end of May. Yes. yes. So, so the Facebook narcissist comes out this spring and we will have a 
part, as part of our monthly author series where we do a deep dive into a particular book uh, and converse with the author about that book and their life and the process. It is a, it's a real treat for me every month um, to have the opportunity to talk to an author about that whole experience. So look forward to that. And again, I'm gonna say this in between each issue, or each speaker, go online, check out issue nine. You can get excerpts, you can see links to all of these artists and individuals personal websites to find out more about them, which I know you want to do. So Lena, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll talk before then, of course, personally, but professionally, we will be looking forward to hanging out with you in May. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Sean. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, Destiny Harper is going to make it tonight. So I'm going to hold off. If she joins us, we'll let her go. Uh, but Destiny contributed a piece about a project she works on. And I wanna make sure I say it right. I, I know I'm gonna say it right, but let's just be sure because of respectfully. So yeah, she works with an unbelievable organization called the Appalachian Prison Book Project, which is pretty self-explanatory, but um, provide books to incarcerated individuals. Um, I really don't wanna step on this piece because it's beautiful uh, and it, it talks about this experience, but I encourage anybody to check this piece out uh, and support that organization in any way they're able, because that is, to me, the kind of work that 1455 is trying to do is to absolutely shine a light on individual artists that are doing this amazing work, but certainly when there are organizations doing really meaningful societal work uh, that makes all of our lives better, it's a tremendous privilege to have an opportunity to showcase that. So um, if, if Destiny is unable to join us tonight, uh, let it suffice to say, uh, I, I salute her, the work she does, and the beautiful piece that she contributed. Um, so next up is Vicki Wicker. Vicki is a newer friend of 1455s, but she has become a force to be reckoned with. Uh, she's prolific. She is an absolutely wonderful literary citizen. Uh, she's tied into different artistic communities. And I'm always inspired by anyone who is not only getting the work done and doing it well, but is also looking to support other writers. So it is and will continue to be a tremendous honor on, on our part to have Vicki involved in anything we do. So Vicki, I welcome you here tonight, not for the first time and certainly not for the last, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, share some of your wonderful work. Oh my gosh. Sean, you are the best host. I swear. I tell everybody, it's like, you really need to tune into this because you got to watch Sean and how he does what he does. Thank you so much for including me in your community. Really honored. Yeah, it's, our, it's my pleasure, sincerely. Yeah. So Sean asked um, us to give a bio of ourselves um, instead of him reading the bio. And and one person mentioned an anti-bio, so I don't know. This will fall somewhere in between. Um, I moved, uh, I'm in upstate New York. I'm near Cooperstown. And in 2011, I was in LA and I bought a $10,000 house in upstate New York. And without seeing it, I bought it off of Facebook. This is a whole Facebook thing here. <laughs> Someone posted this little junky thing and I just, bought it without seeing it, flew out, saw what I bought, flew home and quit my job and walked away from my life in LA. So that was 10 years ago. I was a shoe designer in LA and I moved out here without a job. And I said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll work at a gas station if I have to. And literally in about six years, I'm like, Jesus, I'm going to have to work in a gas station out here. I mean, it's really, if you want to make a living, don't do what I did. Um, so you're catching me at this weird cusp of a time in two weeks, I'm back in LA and, um, maybe starting everything over again in LA, maybe not. I don't know. I'm thinking about keeping my $10,000 farmhouse. Um, but anyway, so that's a little bit, I was a shoe designer out here. I was everything. Um, but all through the through line of my life is writing, um, and I have a saying about my life and my writing, everything leads back to Jack. Everything in my life is because of a writing instructor I met in LA. His name is Jack Grapes. 
He um, he's developed the method writing. He's genius. If you guys ever move to LA, but you can get him on Zoom now. Unbelievable what he does. Um, and everything in my life since I met him, when I met him, it was at LA um, Book Festival, the big, huge book festival. And someone said, you got to meet Jack. And I was at a, a booth and I looked up and there's this roly poly guy. I was like, are you Jack? And I told him that someone said I should take his class. He said, your life will never be the same. And he changed my life in a million ways. So writing, writing has always been near and dear. So that's, that's out here. I didn't find a, a writing community until three years ago. So out here, I work with the poets at Bright Hill Press. Um, just been a godsend. It's in the Catskills. So um, Robert Benson is the poetry instructor there. He's the one who was um, friends with um, Derek Walcott. So there's a kind of a cool thing happening up here, but it took me seven years to find it. Um, but it's, it's great. So this is a, a, a piece of what I'm going to read to you tonight. A little background. I don't usually give a preamble for my stuff, but the preamble on this is um, I almost lost my son last year. And I brought him here and kept him upstate for eight months. And it was almost like a Rumpelstiltskin thing. He One day he woke up and he says, I'm going back. I'm going back to the West Coast. I'm going back to Tijuana. And I was like, okay, you know, go. If that's what you want to do, you're ready. So we did. And he met this guy and it was, it was like that one friend in a lifetime. And the guy took Connor under his wing, introduced him to everybody in Tijuana, found his job for him. They were making plans for their life. And then one night he calls me and he said, I can't find Kyle. So this is how we found Kyle. Okay. Kyle's broken body. Quote, on the road, the driver's belongings could be appreciated. And it was noticed the young man was no longer alive. The occasion is of American nationality, end quote. No, that is not his body on the road. Tijuana sand twisted in his blonde hair. No, he sleeps in the morning light. His head is to one side as if remembering the dream. No, I am the eyes that read those words, those silly words, a translation, Spanish to English. I am the eyes that see Kyle's broken body. He's a post on Facebook. He's a curiosity for a Tijuana news page. He's their mystery now. A young American in a nice black suit, a chalk outline, dust to dust, no. In the photos he is flying, is this real? It appears as if one could touch his wings beneath his broken. So many friends, lovers, and certainly his black loafers in that second photo want to see him again. How we wait for him in his brand new suit with those clean black socks to fly. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Vicki. Um, and thank you for sharing uh, your work, your soul, your story. Um, very inspiring stuff. And like I said before, we will, we will definitely uh, see and hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Christina Seymour. And uh, I, I just don't wanna, I, I don't want to um, be redundant, but I will say as, as the editor, one always is uh, circumspect about 
each new issue and is there going to be more gas in the tank and is there going to be um you know enough quality and it's just so humbling when everything that comes in is is so full of quality and each individual piece could be said to represent the whole to me that's that's what we're really achieving uh at a high level so it is it is an extraordinary honor for me to uh introduce christina seymour who also contributed to this issue thank you i am very excited to be in this issue i especially like the connection theme and i've been enjoying reading all of the pieces and looking at the art and i think that especially right now of course the topic is um meaningful and i'm i like how everything sang in this issue and so a little bit about me is that i live in maryville tennessee which is a little south of knoxville and i am a teacher at maryville college i teach poetry and uh, women's and minority lit class that i created that's going on right now that's always fun to teach um, and different kinds of writing and i'm also a poet um, i have a book called when is a burning tree from glass liar press and uh, I like to be read too, so I plan to just read some of my piece. It's a it's a lyric essay about an Emily Dickinson fragment um, from the Amherst collection of her work, and it was written on a chiropodist, which is a, a foot doctor podiatrist flyer. She wrote it on like half of a, a torn chiropodist flyer. And I just found it really interesting to think about the limit of the page and how that affected the reading experience and also how this poem exists just it, as this fragment as it is on this flyer and not published anywhere. And so I was excited to write it out and see what it looked like. So I wrote the first version as a prose poem and I'll read it in that way. Two things I have lost with childhood, the rapture of losing my shoe in the mud and going home barefoot, waiting for cardinal flowers and the mother's reproof, which was more for my sake than her weary own, for she frowned with a smile. Now mother and cardinal flower are parts of a closed world, but is that all I have lost? Memory drapes her lips. And so that is the, the version if the words were just strung out across the page. Uh, but this is the version that is forced into the flyer. And so I'll try to read it um, the way that it's written. It's a little more difficult. Two things I have lost with childhood, the rapture of losing my shoe in the mud and going home bare foot waiting for cardinal flowers and the mother's reproof which was more for my sake than her very own for she frowned with a smile now mother and cardinal flower are parts of a closed world but is that but is that all I have lost memory drapes her lips. And so I'll read a couple of my paragraphs. Um, the shape of this torn paper forces a kind of Williams rhythm of thought, each word considered, each line ending dictated by an edge. Perhaps without this constraint, Dickinson would not have chosen the consonants and assonance of drapes, her lips, and closed world, because in a longer line, such subtle precision may feel crowded. In this true to form version, rhythms are pronounced. The flowers are cardinal flowers, calling attention to the elemental nature, the brick like texture of the word. The speaker's intuition or slowing component enters first with second thoughts on word choice, and then more apparently with the conceits for she and now. As Dickinson begins correcting herself, editing her words, first waiting for a better rhyme with cardinal, and then more for instead of just for, the reader can see a consciousness embodied on the page. The conjunctive for signals the recreation of mother's reproof as secret approval for she frowned 
with a smile. Um, even more direct than poor she now signals Dickinson's clearest attempt to make sense of her childhood memory. The speaker's tone becomes meditative, nostalgic, and definitional. The excessive use of the dash and the shrinking of the page cause these lines to slow to a state of composition. Dickinson enacts perplexedness and allows her words, closed world, lost, drapes, lips, to shape it slowly to culminate in a final line that shifts attention back to the mother, an adulting, expressive, curious image of a memory draping the lips. Uh, one senses a dissonance in the rhyme of mother and cardinal flower as Dickinson moves closer to the relinquishment of the past as a closed world and into the sadness of loss. <clears throat> and then the final paragraph, with this power found in Dickinson's re recording of memory, the writer is allowed to remake the past, to reown it, and to accept it as uncapturable with an air of playful revision. Dickinson's work has taught us that arriving at vulnerability in a poem is a way of being vulnerable. This work can happen on the page, any old page, as if written consciously, or if written consciously, using one's own diction and rhythm to transcribe a sense making, pleasantly constrained by the physical space of the page, the emotional space of tone, and the mental space of the dash. So I really enjoyed studying this poem and hopefully you all enjoy it too. It has a lot of different angles, I think. And uh, it's fun to study Emily Dickinson. So thanks for listening. Christina, thank you so much. As, as a uh, not quite recovered grad student of English Lit, I can say that your piece uh, scratched a lot of itches, made me feel smarter, um, made me realize how little I know, which, you know, I think for the true scholar is always that weird sweet spot where you feel like you've learned something but you realize gosh there's so much going on in our world of literature and we need uh very intelligent and sensitive tour guides to help get us through that so your piece uh, is both inspiring and daunting because of uh, the erudition on display so very very grateful for uh, you sharing that with us okay uh next up I am extraordinarily happy to introduce my friend, Martha Schumacher. Martha, uh, her, the piece that she submitted uh, was an immediate winner uh, and, and was going to find its way into this issue without any question. But I, I would be remiss to not say that while this has no uh, bearing on anything, uh, Martha and I know each other, and she is a supporter of 1455. She is an absolutely uh, generous and indefatigable supporter of the arts in general, but she's been really kind to me personally, and I always learn a lot from her uh, about the work she does. So I'm, I'm grateful that she shared her work, uh, and it's an extraordinary pleasure for me to see her in action because I'm sure she's a little bit nervous. So Martha, welcome. present a lot but as as uh you know uh sean knows and some and my family and friends know i actually present a lot but not in this kind of uh <laughs> setting and i am definitely not a professional writer of this type so i'm i feel uh extremely humbled to be with this group so i was speaking of presentations i was actually giving a presentation some years ago in anchorage alaska and the person who introduced me did something really creative that I just thought would be kind of fun to share with this group. He introduced me with a 100% fake bio. And so my favorite two lines were this, Martha has been to the moon twice, but don't ask her about it because she never discusses that time in her life. So I just thought I would share that because it just makes me smile every time I think about it. And I also think that that young man uh, has a few, I, I hope he's still writing today because I think he has a bright future in writing. So I'm actually sitting here in, Alexand in Alexandria, Virginia with my husband, Casey, he's actually right off camera and our two rescue dogs, Gage and Josie. On the professional front, I'm a champion for the social impact sector and I work with nonprofits, AKA social impact organizations to make them stronger. 
So my original version of this piece was written in early January 2021 when many Americans were waiting not so patiently for the opportunity to get our first vaccination. Remember that? Fast forward to more than a year later, and the good news is that we now only have four Mondays left until spring. But going back to that moment in time in January 2021, I was actually in a dark place. My mother had died just three months earlier, and I was also going through some pretty significant professional changes. I would say most of all that I had the pandemic blues and then some. Fortuitously, I was taking a class with a writing group led by Justin Aaron, who's a good friend of Sean's. He's amazing, yes, absolutely. And his encouragement along with that of my classmates really inspired me to focus on writing something more personal about how I was feeling in that moment. So I penned a blog post, which was very similar to the piece I'm about to read, though this version is updated for today. Tweaks included calling out the Omicron variant, remember that we didn't know about that a year ago now, and changing the countdown from getting vaxxed last year to this year's midterm elections. So about that in terms of vaccinations, I'm sure we all remember how anxious we were for the vaccine. While aspiring to be thoughtful and gracious about prioritizing those who were older, immunocompromised, et cetera. And by the way, Lena, I really appreciated your comments earlier about immunocompromised folks as my husband actually falls into that category. Okay, yeah, I'll admit it. <laughs> gotta, gotta keep it real here, folks. Albeit somewhat really embarrassingly that one of my closest friends and I came clean with each other during that time period about how disappointed we were to have to wait weeks, if not months, before that vaccine would happen for us. This is a viewpoint that remains very entitled. For example, only two countries on the entire African continent today have a vaccination rate above 35% with many falling far below that figure. So that's access and privilege indeed. With that, here goes. 70 till spring, 70 more days, 10 more weeks, just 10 more Mondays, then spring breaks through. I'm done with other counting and countdowns. C-19 cases, midterm elections, virtual assemblies by the thousands, business meetings, family gatherings, less than happy hours. Tracking Omicron, though in a first for this dessert lover, I'm hoping there will be no pie. Only one day counts now. The start of the first 2022 solstice will be one for the history books. Time's relentless forward march forging a welcome milestone bringing with it new beginnings, new opportunities. A breath of fresh air as we journey back outside and, dare I say it, begin to congregate safely once again to reconnect face-to-face -face as a community. How far will have come by then since our annual blooming rite of passage in 2020, when most in North America were merely one week in? blissfully unaware of the long haul that would follow of the isolating, emotionally twisty road ahead. 70 more days and nights till the promise of a new era arrives. Thank you so much, Martha. And listen, I know that you are the consummate people person. Uh, you are an extrovert in all the right ways. So I know that, that these last two years uh, have been particularly challenging, both personally and professionally. And here you are, you know, always trying to kind of stay focused on the positive and the aspirational. So I think that is what I and many others see in you. So again, thank you for sharing uh, that perspective with us uh, and, and congratulations for um, branching out into, you know, other areas of expertise that you can develop. More of that, please. Okay, moving along. Uh, I, 
I'm so happy to have Rebecca Holler in the house. I uh, got to know Rebecca as a writer and boy, is she a gifted writer as you're about to see. I've been fortunate enough to, to know her as a supporter of 1455, as a friend, as an advocate for the arts. And um, she's one of those people, she, I, I kind of, well, I don't even jokingly, I, I call her the ninja because she just gets things done uh, and doesn't make any fuss about it doesn't look for any, uh, you know, acclaim, but she comes into a room and, and makes it better with her presence. So she is another uh, all-star that always is lifting 1455's profile just by being any part of anything we do. And uh, she's funny. And uh, her piece, which I hope she's going to read for us, uh, is a really good window into what I would call the Rebecca Holler experience. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Are you available to do all of my introductions? Anytime. That would be great. Um, I wasn't going to read much from this, but should I should I just go for it and read? Absolutely. Okay. I wasn't going to read uh, too much of it uh, for the very selfish reason that I have not had dinner yet, and this piece will make me very hungry. Um, so I, I'm Rebecca Haller. I am. I live in. Washington DC with my husband and my golden doodle, Samantha Seaborn. Uh, I am a recovering journalist um, by trade. I am a design thinking researcher uh, by heart. I am a writer and a traveler. I love to travel as much as possible. Uh, so I, what, I, what I work on writing wise, um, it actually started, Lena, we should probably talk sometime. Uh, it, this, I started a project a few years ago. Uh, it started as a social media experiment to be more vulnerable in a space that we're very edited. And I called it lies I've told my therapist. And it evolved later into a website where I have essays um, that I wrote and am now in the process of turning into a memoir. And the website has evolved into more of a crowdsourcing platform where people can share anonymously or otherwise uh, the, their own lies they've told their therapists, which is typically to say the lies we tell ourselves. Um, but without further ado, that tends to be a little bit heavier content. This was a lot of fun to write because it is much lighter. This, is, this piece is called An Ode to the Men's Cookbook Club. Four years ago on a snowy New Year's Eve in rural Pennsylvania at the wedding of dear friends, an idea was born over vodka sodas and whiskeys on the rocks, the Men's Cookbook Club. The concept was simple, the, the reality far more elaborate. Three longtime DC-based friends, my husband, Matt Haller, Bennett Richardson, and Ali Tulba, choose a cookbook and whip up a fancy feast for their partners. Like a favorite book club, but with gourmet cuisine in addition, in addition to talk of the tome. These dinner parties don't just come together out of nowhere. Not that I would know because I don't cook. The first step in the men's cookbook club is to study the cookbook. As a bona fide bibliophile and avid reader, I'll be the first to admit I never really gave cookbooks their due until the men's cookbook club came to be. I'd often poke fun at my husband for flipping through cookbooks, studying them, reading them like an addictive novel while sitting on the couch or on an airplane. I've since come to appreciate the obvious. True chefs don't rely on the index to know what's inside. They start at page one. Cookbook readers, they're just like us. The camaraderie doesn't start and stop in the kitchen. There's the meal planning. After selecting and studying the cookbook, typically a newer one to hit the shelves or one from a buzzy chef, the men get, in, get on a conference call, FaceTime, or naturally sit down for a meal to plan the menu. The first meeting of the men's cookbook club set many precedents, which are still followed like protocols whenever possible, including grocery shopping, sometimes at a local farmer's market, together as a group, book and tote. A potluck dinner, this is anything but. The day of the dinner party, sometimes the night before, Matt, Bennett, and Ali take to their individual kitchens to do as much prep and advance work as possible. While I'm not privy to the contents of the Men's Cookbook Club text group, only the one of the larger group of the three couples, I can tell you there's often a lot of laughter that comes out of the kitchen during meal prep time. 
My understanding is the guys provide one another with status updates and occasional play-by-plays of the process. It's like the butterball hotline, but open year round. Lindsay and I once coined the term fexting or sexting, but with food pictures to describe the fellow's texting habits. Rarely does an elaborate home cooked meal go by without the other club members being made aware of it. They may be cooking alone, but they're always doing so together. The first meeting of the Men's Cookbook Club took place in spring of 2018. Matt and I played host, which means technically I did lift a finger, but honestly, barely. I still remember the air of excitement surrounding that day. It was warm out, so in what would prove to be good practice for a pandemic coming down the pike in a few years, we dined al fresco. As the couples arrived, the men went into the kitchen to get to work finalizing their dishes. Ali, our resident mixologist, concocted his take on a refreshing paper plain cocktail, served over a big ice cube and garnished with a slice of lime. We all toasted over the cookbook. Allison Roman's dining in, another harbinger of what was to come had we fast forwarded to 2020, calling the inaugural Men's Cookbook Club to order. It's easy to go back and see exactly what was cooked up at that first meeting of the Men's Cookbook Club because, and quite possibly my favorite part of the club, the men sign each other's books with the recipes they contributed. And thank goodness, because un, upon unscientific review, my husband has since cooked everything else in this book and memories involving taste buds can sometimes get mixed up. I have to wash my hands every time I handle this particular cookbook, however, as it's splattered with oil and grease and God knows what else. This, I'm told, as someone who treats her own books a bit too preciously, is the sign of a well-loved book. The menu of the inaugural Men's Cookbook Club included meeting included burrata with tangerines, shallots, and watercress, grilled squid with spicy, garlicky white beans and vinegared tomatoes, grilled branzino with lemons all of the ways, an off-menu homemade pizza was grilled in a cast iron pan at the last minute and served just for fun. Dessert was a lemon shaker tart. It goes without saying the best part, at least as a mere diner, although I'm confident all would agree, is sitting down together to enjoy the meal. If the kitchen is the heart of the house, the dining table is its soul, and the men's cookbook club nourishes both. The dishes, of course, are the true guests of honor. More than excuses to eat incredible food and sip fancy cocktails, meetings of the Men's Cookbook Club are, at least to me, meals with meaning. When's the last time you took the time to make something alongside your friends? Not for them, with them. Don't get me wrong, traditional dinner parties are a delight in their own right. Potlucks too have their place. But what the Men's Cookbook Club brings to the table is a sense of connection that runs deeper than plates piled high of delicious food. There's a mindfulness, a constant sense of presence woven into these meals. There's a degree of care, of community. It's easy to talk about surface subjects over dinner and dive into the food as soon as it's served. It's a whole other experience to savor each bite while learning what went into making it, the ingredients, the steps. I, for one, relish the opportunity to hear the chefs discuss each dish in detail, like putting tangible lessons learned on a plate and saying, here, have some more. A good sign is often the silence blanketing the table upon first bites, but the silence never lasts long at these meals. We discuss the dishes and the cookbook authors, of course. Alison Roman, fun and never overcomplicated. Uh, Samin Nosrat, and I apologize for butchering any of these cookbook authors' names. Unpretentious and delicious. Sean Brock, delicious, but challenging for the sake of being challenging. Yodom Oleg Otto Lenghi, surprisingly simple, but exploding with flavor. But we dish about more than sides and entrees too. One topic that doesn't get discussed often, if at all, is work, which is really saying something for a dinner table in Washington, DC. There's no such spoken rule prohibiting the subject, but I believe it speaks more to the depth of the group, to our individual desires to collectively commune over conversations of consequence with good friends, we talk about politics and what's going on in the world. We talk about our parents getting older. We talk about travel. We talk about grief. A recent topic included the controversial ingredient, MSG, and the xenophobic marketing that gave it a bad rap. And what something like that means for and in kitchens around the world. I always walk away from these meals having learned something, in addition to being sore from laughter, both of which tend to be my personal metrics for time well spent. Matt turned 40 
a couple weeks after the pandemic brought the world to its knees in 2020. A few days earlier, we'd obviously had to cancel a previously planned cookbook club meeting, an early pandemic heartbreak. On a whim, I reached out to Allison Roman, the author behind our first cookbook club meeting, to see if she'd be game to surprise Matt over Zoom, along with the men's cookbook club and a few other dear friends, including the couple whose wedding inspired the group in the first place. Far from her target demographic, and likely in spite of this, alongside a dash of early pandemic boredom, she responded with a resounding hell yes. She graci graciously spent more than an hour with us talking about life and food. The next day, the group text group was the nonstop stream of comments about how nice it was to get together, even virtually, how normal it felt after two weeks of anything but. Strangely, I woke up this morning and for a moment had a dim feeling that everyone had been over to the house last night, all we texted the group, which right now is about the best gift anyone could ask for. Many months later, the group got together for the first pandemic era meeting of the Men's Cookbook Club, all of our first real group gatherings since COVID-19 made its appearance. It was so nice to be back together around the table, albeit outside and with a bit more distance than we were accustomed to, with individual servings of everything from appetizer plates to hand sanitizer. Mostly it felt good to be back in communion with one another. Y'all, that was such a pleasure getting together and seeing all of you. Alana texted the group the next morning. We did it again the following month. After dinner, we watched then President Biden, President elect Biden's historic victory speech on TV as a family, the family we've become, one often with differing opinions, but with a shared love of breaking bread. These meals keep these meals bring us together, like ingredients in a recipe. The company keeps us coming back. All this from a cookbook. Thank you, Rebecca, and also curse you because boy, do I want to talk, I want to eat all of that stuff. Um, look, I think we'd all agree, literature is all good and well, but it's all about the food, baby, and breaking bread with friends. And, you know, on the theme of connection, whether one's an artist or not, what better way to, to you know, um, form those bonds and, and, and establish deep, communication and connection, um, this, this issue would have, would have definitely been lacking something without that real kind of tactile reminder of not only what's important in life, friendship and community via the creativity in the kitchen, but um, what we've been missing so much. So here's hoping that we're edging closer to being able to gather safely uh, as friends. And um, yeah, I want some grilled octopus. So uh, I'll follow up with you uh, after the after the call. Um, she has not joined yet, but Denise Robbins, who contributed a couple of uh, wonderful poems, I think said she might be able to join late. So I'm gonna hold out hope that she'll pop in uh, before we're done here. But if she's not able to, Denise Robbins contributed a couple of beautiful poems on the theme of connection, uh, but a lot more than that. So of course, while you're checking out everyone else's work, uh, I want to give a shout out to her if she's not able to read her work tonight. And now for something, I won't say completely different, but refreshingly different and very relevant and very necessary. Uh, we really kind of elevated the, the levels of ways we think about connection and interpersonal connection with ourselves. Um, I would never have imagined I wouldn't have had the creativity or the, or the intelligence to solicit a piece like this. So it is with gr extraordinary gratitude that I introduced Haley Hoffman, who wrote a piece that um, couldn't be more relevant, I think, for, for anyone, but I think especially artists who maybe lose sight of some of the things she talks about. Haley, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be among this company. Um, I, I, I was thinking about, wow, how do I, how do I tell you who I am? I've, I've come a very checkered path to get to this place. And I feel like everybody who has come ahead of me has touched on some thread in my life already. I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee at one point. I was a professional chef at another time in my life. I am an artist in another way in my life. And so 
I am like this odd combination of things. And about um, seven years ago, I made a major life career change and went from being somebody who designed retail stores to somebody who is doing therapy with people in couples relationships. I am a certified Imago relationship therapist. Um, I got here, um, I, as I say, I earned my seat here. Um, years and years ago, um, I had um, been married for 25 years and got divorced and met a man who we both agreed on our first date that we were never getting married again. And um, we've now been married together for almost 10 years. Um, but when we met, he said, hey, if we're going to be in a relationship together, we have to go and do this workshop called Getting the Love You Want. And um, I was like, yeah, I don't do therapy. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, no, we're going to do this. And so off we went. And that was part of one of those transformational things. I think I've had three major transformational moments in my life, and that was one of them. Um, earlier on, I had gotten into Al-Anon as a, uh, a person whose life had been affected by another person's drinking, and um, that was a transformational experience for me. And then about two years ago, I had a new transformational experience. And that was when I first heard Deb Dana talk about her work in polyvagal theory. And that is what I wrote about in my, my piece that I shared with you all. Um, we all are just, you know, vibrating nervous systems running into each other in the universe. And we are filling the space with that energy. And one of the things that, that I, I say all of the time in Polyvagal is um, it's about the narrative. And so here we are talking about the stories that you all tell. And in, in Polyvagal Theory, which was developed by Stephen Porges, um, what we say is that the story always follows the state. And if you know what state you're in, if you know whether you are at that top of your autonomic ladder and you're in a state of, of connection and joyful aliveness and engagement with people, then the story is going to reflect that. And if you are in a state of mobilized energy, then that, that feeling of fight or flight, then the story is going to reflect that. And if you're in a state of shutdown and despair, which I think many of us have experienced in the last couple of years, then your story is going to reflect that. And I, I feel like I've been seeing that tonight, that all of your stories reflecting these various states that you've been in. The, the thing that I want to share with you is lately, in the last couple of, of weeks, I have been trying to convince people to start to create um, resource baskets in their homes. I want you to fill these baskets with the things that remind you to do the things that regulate your nervous system. I have no idea whether you're going to be able to see this on, on um, Facebook in the way that I can see it sitting here in my office. But if you don't know what a bubble bear is, I'm going to introduce you to a bubble bear. So this is your bubble bear. And when you unscrew it, and you squeeze him gently, up pops your little wand and so breathing is the way I regulate my nervous system and blowing is a good way for me to breathe. So I blow bubbles in my office on a regular basis so that I can regulate my breathing. Another thing that I'm putting in my little basket of resources is um, a blues harmonica, because what we all need to do is inhale and exhale and expressing my emotions by blowing in and out is the most satisfying thing I've done in the last two years. So I'm going to recommend that you can buy a harmonica for 10 bucks. Get yourself a harmonica. You don't have to get a blues harmonica like I did, but I think I needed to express feeling a little bit blue. And, and just look for ways to breathe. Find different ways to breathe. That's, that's the 
the piece that I took away from, from everything that I've been doing in this, this world of polyvagal is if I can find ways to breathe, then I can be connected to myself. I can be connected to the world. I can be connected to the people that are around me. And that is my goal, to stay in connection. And I really appreciate getting a chance to talk to you all tonight. Hey, I just want to, I mean, listen, for me personally, I think, you know, I, I think we would all agree. And I think many of us in the artistic and, and you know, non-artistic community, we have to support each other. We have to look out for one another, but we can't do that if we're not taking care of ourselves and, and, and being cognizant of our own mental and physical well-being. So this is such a necessary and, and vital reminder uh, of those things. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you sharing your wisdom with us. And um, it's not lost on me that, that remembering to breathe is the first step to any creative act, uh, any act of connection. So um, thank you for, for sharing that and parting that generosity with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And exhale. That's the big one. Exhale. <laughs> As Mr. Miyagi said, don't forget to breathe. Very important. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next artist, I will just introduce by saying, all I need to do is see her name in my inbox and it makes me happy. She's that kind of person, ebullient, positive, impactful, amazingly talented, soulful. Shall I go on? Um, Crystal May Statler uh, was part of our summer festival last year. It was my incredible privilege to include her and, and allowing her to read from her work. Um, so she is yet another, you see a theme developing here, another friend of 1455 that it is our pleasure to include in our company. Um, but when she reached out to contribute a piece, it was like, you know, are there other ways to say yes without just saying yes. So Crystal, thank you for being part of our family. And uh, thank you for continuing to share your brilliant work with us. Um, without further ado, take the stage, please. Oh, thank you so much. Um, it really feels wonderful when you find family. Um, and I think with 1455 and with you, Sean, that is one of those like really treasured parts that have come out of um, out of COVID because without the virtual space, we would have otherwise maybe not been connected. So thank you. And um, thank you everyone who's joining us tonight. I'm going to step out of the box here and try to share my screen. So we're gonna just test it out to see. Um, so I am curious if you can see what I can see. Yes. Okay, cool. I have like Facebook up at the same time. Okay. Um, so the piece that I submitted for movable type is called benign fruit and it's photographed by my dear lifelong friend Rebecca Gustafson um, from a exhibit that it was featured in in October of 2021. Um, this piece is a testament to the difficulties black women and men face in seeking medical treatment and the power of awareness for our collective breast health. On the right of the screen, you'll see this is the image that's included in the um, 1455 zine. And then on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, I'm just gonna play the video from the exhibit while I read the text that is on the canvas. Um, the only other thing that you need to know is that it's 15 sonograms from uh, 2013. At 14, a benign tumor the size of three ripe apples in my right breast was removed. At 23, a recurrent benign tumor, the size of a peach in my right breast was identified. In each doctor's visit since, I describe the pain of a peach and they reply, these things are normal for women like you. I know the pain seems bad, but you just have fibrous breasts. This might just be something small you learn to live with. And in response to this piece, I wrote an acrostic poem 
and it's called inflammable. It's been eight years since the doctor stuck needles to test for cancerous cells in my fibrous breasts. I should be grateful the results list a benign diagnosis, but those results also mean carrying the peach size mass as I'm told to monitor the pain for a few months. Watch if anything changes, it worsens. Why don't they believe me? They say, you could learn to live with it. These things are normal for women like you. And each checkup, I wonder how much longer until my peach rots. Thank you very much. Crystal, thank you for the deep humanity and vulnerability um, and, and the solidarity I think we can all feel with, with what you're expressing uh, and, and the, the sincere love for both the art and the person, the person expressing it. Um, it's a joy to have you as part of this conversation. Thank you, thank you. And if I could just do one quick shout out to just remind everyone, men, women, non-gender, binary, everything, please get your breasts checked as much as you can. You're here, you're here. Okay, um, I think in part because uh, of, a, of a significant uh, geographical time change, uh, Karishma D'Souza is not able to join us tonight. She also, like Kim Tridman, uh, allowed us, gave us the absolute honor of, of showcasing some of her arresting and just beautiful visual art. So I, I will just simply say, if, if you are inclined to go to our site, please do, uh, and, and just scroll through uh, Karishma's unbelievable work and check out her website, which is linked from her bio. Uh, and if you're further inclined, support uh, true independ independent uh, visionary artists. Um, her, her work was an extraordinary honor to include in this issue. I wish she could be here. She was in our summer festival last year and uh, we will hear from her again. So if she couldn't be here tonight, excuse me, so be it. Um, next up uh, is Susan Wads. Um, that Susan, your your contribution was a mic drop of sorts, and I knew, or I, I should say, as a writer, I, I kind of I kind of suspected this would be the piece that bookended um, uh, the issue. So I'll say no more than that. How I I'd love you to introduce yourself and, and read your uh, amazing poem. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you, because um, as I'm listening to the others, I'm thinking, why did he, you, you were so quick with your acceptance of my piece. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, no, I've just, I'm kind of new to this. I mean, I, I read the, um, the e-zine and, you know, love to get your emails and stuff, but I've never kind of been a part of any of this. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just, when I saw the theme connection, I went, Oh, I have a poem. I have a poem about connection. So um, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm an Amherst Writers and Artists uh, facilitator, AWA, um, brought about by the marvelous uh, Pat Schneider. And uh, we do, just for interest sake, we do every year in May, we do something called Write Around the World, where uh, facilitators from all over the world uh, offer workshops to um, help people or not to help people but to introduce people to the work uh, these wonderful writing uh, workshops that really help people find their voice and um, it's good for everybody i've been writing in the awa method for um, about 12 years now and because of that method i've written three novels and a memoir and lots of short stories and poems and stuff. So uh, it really gets the, the pen moving. It's wonderful. And finally, finally, after all that time, I am uh, now a debut author. Um, my first novel, What the Living Do, will be released uh, in 
have a bit of a time to go, but it's Ring 2024 um, by Regal House Publishing. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so yeah, I lead retreats and workshops internationally. And uh, here I'm in Canada. I'm in a very cold central Ontario, Canada. And um, oh, and I just have to say, I was really, really happy to hear uh, Vicky talk about Jack Grapes because I, I did have the uh, honor of going to Los Angeles and sitting in his classes for a week. And I was just yeah, it changed. It changed everything. That deep, deep voice was uh, marvelous. Anyway, I don't know. Oh, and kind of, you know, to how I supported myself for the last few decades is as a, a rebalancer, a body worker. So my, my work tends to be very embodied. And that's been a bit of a challenge <laughs> in these last years. But um, and yeah, and that brings me to my poem. So I will just read it. It's called, um, this is for my wonderful old time friend. We, we don't, we say most enduring friend as opposed to my oldest friend um, who lives a couple thousand miles away, Barbara Bergen. It's called Zoom Call with an Old Friend. It's after Kim Adon, Adonisio. Uh, her poem, The Flowers Are For You. Back against the door, feet braced on the parquet. I don't speak what scares me. Instead, I say the other things, the success of new bread, the red nubs of rhubarb, spring leeks in the green soup. No, I say, tell me the rest. I'm a lucky one, I say, no right to be sad. I conceal my raggedness with a flowered dress, ask if it's true that light comes in where a thing has cracked. A thousand miles away, you lean in close and say, tell me, old friend, tell me everything. That last line uh, destroyed me in all the right ways. And I really, again, I mean, I, I think I, I feel very comfortable and confident saying that truly all of these pieces do and could represent the whole but that last line and on the theme of connection and what we're going through, I think we all would agree is, is you're, you're really cutting to the core of like what we're all dealing with and, and what is connection all about, you know, and especially in a time of not being able to connect the way we have taken for granted, perhaps. Um, you just, you just nailed it. So thank you for, providing a, a, a mic drop and exclamation point of sorts uh, on, on this issue. And last and far from least, um, I mean, like the, it's like an embarrassment of riches, but when I mentioned earlier that, that movable type, I think, you know, we're, we're doing what we're doing because we can. It, it occurred to our internal folks, and I do want to give a shout out, um, to Morgan Ryan, who is 1455's creative director, um, in many regards, my right-hand woman on so many endeavors. Um, she, she's way more than a creative director. She's uh, a leader in our, in our organization and a, a dear friend um, and, and someone that challenges and inspires me all the time. But she is, the, so if you, if you do go and, and you should marvel at the layout and the design, zero credit. Morgan Ryan is the person that makes it look the way it looks. Um, so we are all indebted to her for turning wonderful stuff into something even more profound and beautiful. Um, but what we realized was we can and should be accommodating all forms of storytelling. And yes, that includes writing. Yes, that includes the different genres of writing. It can and should include visual art, and it certainly should include music. And not, I didn't do this on, on purpose. In fact, anyone that knows me knows that half of my wardrobe features uh, musicians, but uh, Quentin Walston is a, a recent um, acquaintance of mine. I think we've, we've connected on some deep levels, not least of which is that he is a brilliant jazz pianist so he had me at hello, um, and he and I, it's gonna be my pleasure to appear with him at the Barnes of Rose Hill 
in Berryville, Virginia on February 26th um, to do a poetry music event where I'll be reading some of my poetry and he'll be doing some interpretations of uh, jazz standards. More on that at the 1455 site, but I realized while we were putting this issue together, we could and should feature some of his work. So Quentin, um, please uh, step up and, and talk about you know, what you do and how you do it and why you do it. Thank you so much, Sean. And I have to say, I feel really honored and also humbled to be in such great company. I mean, you guys are amazing writers, amazing artists. Um, I, I am feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome being a musician around you all. So um, it's been just a pleasure to sit here and listen to each person and get to, I feel like I've gotten to know you all just through your work and through um, your, your self, your bios and stuff. So, so thank you. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, as Sean mentioned, I'm a jazz pianist, so I'm a musician. I, I'm also a composer, so I mostly write for my trio, which is piano, bass, and drums, but I've also been uh, writing for ensembles. Um, I'm writing for a, st a student ensemble right now uh, in Loudoun County, which is where I live. Um, so that's been, been a real exciting, a really big blessing to be able to do that. My wife and I live here with our 14 month old son, Isaiah. So it's been uh, a really exciting time. Um, and if you do the math, he's kind of a, a COVID baby. And that kind of gets into the, uh, my recent release, um, which is called The Good Book Suite. Um, so it's, it's an album. I have it right here. And and how it has to do with connection is really, is really interesting. It, and mostly that I want to be able to encourage people, um, especially that, that feeling of despair. I know that a lot of folks were, were feeling that and have felt that um, and manifest in different ways. Right around March, 2020, um, my wife lost her job, which means she lost her health insurance and being, me being a musician means that I also lost my health insurance. I'm a type one diabetic, so that's a little scary. Um, and the same day we found out she was pregnant, which was amazing. We, we've been trying, it wasn't a surprise, but that kind of fear about, oh, okay, what's gonna happen next? Pregnant wife, yeah, job, all that stuff. And then a, a global pandemic decided to happen. So it was definitely, um, I was feeling a lot of kind of pressure in that despair. Um, and having been a recent um, Christian, a born again Christian, um, my response was to just dive into scripture. So that's what I did. Um, and there's a lot of encouragement in the prophet Isaiah, which talks about, don't be afraid, like fear not, I'm with you, I got this. And the imagery in this one verse that says like, you will walk through the waters, but they won't sweep over you. And you'll walk through the fire, but you won't be burned, um, had such a profound impact with for me. Because it wasn't that this is some like prosperity gospel, like, oh, if you become a Christian, like everything's going to be roses. Um, the Bible was saying like hard stuff's going to happen, but I'm going to be with you. So that uh, I really sat on that and kind of meditated on that. And as creatives, usually what when something is, our mind is saturated on something that usually comes out in what we create. So um, I started writing and working with these themes. And in the same way that I was kind of returning again and again to those verses, I decided to compose in that way. Usually um, I'm, I like stuffing in as much stuff into my songs. I'm, jazz is already kind of gets a bad rap sometimes for being very intellectual. So I usually kind of fall right into that. Lots of complex chord progressions and things like that. Um, but for this one, I wanted to really simplify all of these, all of the movements of each of the suite as a little motif. For instance, in the opening song, which is called Fear Not, um, it's fear not, I'm with you till the end of the age. Um, I had like a four measure idea. And I remember I was bringing it to my band saying like, okay, I love this idea, but I'm not quite sure what I want to do with it. And we were just kind of playing with it and looping it again and again. And it was building and crescendo and, and morphing and all this stuff. And then I was like, okay, well, what do we do next? 
my bass player says nothing. Like that's it. That's that's the whole piece. Um, so I, I would encourage you to listen to it. And it's really, really interesting what we were able to do with just these these little ideas that we just repeat to ourselves. So, um, and my hope is that even, that even if you're not a, a Christian or, or, or have a faith that you still find encouragement, I think music is a wonderful way to encourage people. So that's one of the ways that I really want to connect to people with this album. Like it's not an album that's only meant for a singular audience. I really just want people to, to experience joy and feel that there's no reason to despair like it's, it's going to be okay so um if you guys are okay i have a piano right here um the big reveal <laughs> i apologize in advance if it's out of tune because it's february and there's a window right here and temperature and humidity but i'll do my best i'm going to play um kind of the theme of the second song, which is called I'm With You, where there's so many of those verses that say, fear not, I'm with you. So here it is. <laughs> piano solo and all sorts of fun stuff after that so but yeah so so thank you so much um it, it was so fun to write it the the third movement gets really intense and the fourth movement has some beautiful resolution to it so um yeah so i, I encourage uh you guys to to check it out um yeah it, it was a really fun project and um yeah i feel very grateful to be able to show it to you all so thank you when, I mean, thank you so much. And, and look, I mean, talk about an inaugural event that you are, you are our first and definitely not our last, uh, you know, musical contributor. And, and, and thank you for helping us broaden our vistas. And listen, I'll say truthfully, as we were putting this issue together, I was going down the rabbit hole of your YouTube page and listening to your music. So, I mean, the theme of, the theme of connection we don't need to put too fine a point on it, it has shown through in terms of the, the unbelievable variety and diversity uh, and humanity on display. But it also, you know, we inspired each other throughout the creation of this issue. So tonight to me is just a validation of, of all of this, you know, abundant creativity and humanity. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. Thank you for being part of Movable Type. And uh, those of you checking us out, and we are recording this, so those of you that, that stumble upon this, as a reminder, the Movable Type, issue number nine on the theme of connection is available free at 1455litarts.org. I could not more enthusiastically encourage you to go check out the issue, take some time, click on each individual piece, you will be able to experience the art, 
you'll be able to read the bio and you'll also, in I think almost all the cases, be able to click on a link to these artists' uh, web pages, and you can take a deeper dive into their work, which I guarantee will broaden your horizons and improve your life. So uh, thank you all contributors for being here. You are amazing. Thank you audience for being here. Um, stay safe, be well. The issue number 10, which we'll release in March is on the issue of power. However, that is to be interpreted. So spread the word. We'd love to see uh, submissions. Uh, we want to continue this trend. I think the bar is, is pretty high and thank you all for that. Goals are, are meant to be you know, achieved. So let's try to meet the bar that was established tonight. I, I certainly will be humble and happy if we can even approximate the variety uh, and talent that we saw tonight. So uh, I wish everyone a safe and peaceful evening. Um, be in touch and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.